Hey all, welcome to the home of hard science, but simple solutions, often. So this is the ultimate vitamin D talk, I think. We can't cover everything, but this is all you need to know on vitamin D. So I gave this talk yesterday for Doctors for Patients UK, an excellent group of doctors in the UK. And uh, I was so pleased with it, actually. I got the recording and kind of put it together here. So... Enjoy the ultimate vitamin D video and it also covers all the interactions with COVID as well. So enjoy. These were people I thanked back then. I, I spoke to many of them, really great people in the world of vitamin D. So you can you can look at that slide afterwards and look them up. Interestingly, Dr. David Grimes, he's now in his 80s, a lovely British doctor, gentleman. And he's done incredible work on vitamin D. And interestingly, when COVID came up, he was a very strong voice, similar to mine, questioning a lot of what was going on. And he even, a few months before the vaccine was released, uh, was imploring people to get their vitamin D up before they took it because of the potential autoimmune effects and being high in vitamin D could avoid side effects, etc. So he's a great guy. And Dr. Chris Masterjohn as well, brilliant mind, great work he's been doing with Weston Price, actually, you know, the book you showed there. And he also, not too surprisingly, was very sanguine and came out very honestly about COVID. So kind of very interesting. So I'm going to start with, with more recent events on vitamin D. And this came out from Israel, an incredible study. It was extremely well executed. It was very well corrected for prior medical histories. It was corrected for age. Uh, they used vitamin D readings from many years, or at least a couple of years previously. So they avoided this problem of the accusation that, well, you got the COVID, you got sick, and it caused your vitamin D blood level to go down. And therefore, there's reverse causation. And, and that's nonsense. So they went back two years. So they did a lot of good stuff. And uh, it was in the mainstream, briefly, peripherally, and didn't gain traction, which is amazing, uh, given the numbers. And you can just see a summary slide here, and it's kind of self-evident to anyone who's been reading these kinds of plots. The people who suffered from COVID had low vitamin D, basically. And the people who had reasonable, not high, but reasonable vitamin D uh, pretty much dominated with mild cases and outcomes, regardless of age, regardless of history. Uh, so here's the level from all the work that I've done. I would suggest you'd want to be in the 40s nanogram units of vitamin D or in the low hundreds in nanomole. So there are two different units. 2.5 is the multiplier between them but nanograms is more established so there's the line you should be at and as you can see the people who had reasonable vitamin d and all had mild cases they still weren't really where i'd want them <laughs> so they're actually still low uh, compared to the ancestral level so just goes to show you so i covered vitamin d and covid quite early this was 27th of april uh, i covered one of the first studies and it showed similar results to this one. It was astonishing the importance of vitamin D in COVID outcome. Um, and there's the screen. And just pulling out another page from the study, what's interesting here is that, yeah, they, they covered for multiple corrections, but it just didn't change anything. It's not like the correcting for age or prior history or you know how far back the vitamin D was measured kind of somewhat changed the results actually didn't change results at all. So it shows you the power of this association. And just taking another slide here with some of the data, really interestingly also, the people who were high, who remember had incredibly mild cases regardless of age throughout, it, they still had loads of problems. Like, it's not like, well, they didn't have diabetes and they didn't have hypertension, so they were healthy for other reasons. 45% had hypertension. I think medicated, nearly a third were type 2 diabetic. They still had mild cases, but the only thing that distinguished them was they had a high blood level of vitamin D. So you can see the sheer power of having a high level. And again, I hasten to add, not necessarily just jacked up with supplements. They, they were naturally high, though we don't know how many took supplements. So here's the results, and uh, normal, above 40 nanogram, which in fairness is pretty good, that's the baseline for impact, 
for severity and other studies also mortality outcome same kind of risk multipliers sufficient pretty much the same as above 40 so even above 30 we're pretty fine insufficient then things begin to get a little hairy 20 to 30 nanogram and this would be considered fine above 20 in the western medical system but you can see already of a two and a half multiplier that's a big multiplier okay but then we have deficient so anyone below 20 that includes 19s 18s 17s 16s i guess it includes down to around 10 which is profoundly deficient and that was the risk multiplier i mean like you just don't see risk multipliers like this even in in very serious risk factors for uh, outcomes i mean it's just shocking uh, and in fairness the daily mail covered it but mostly there was radio silence on this study i wonder why and just to compare we all know that smoking and lung cancer is it's the classic example of a huge risk multiplier smoking is a disaster nine out of ten people with lung cancer are smokers it's the biggest one out there i mean cholesterol with heart disease associational linkage is around 1.1 <laughs> roughly per full millimole extra ldl i mean it doesn't even count as a risk factor but smoking's massive we know that but look at this study as big or bigger than smoking and lung cancer no one cares and just interestingly, this was 22, late 22, the Israel study I'm talking about. But the April study that first came out, I show on the right, pretty much the same kind of outcomes. That's the one I featured in my April 2020 uh, talk on this. So there you are, you know, 10x rough and tough for being below 20. And why? Again, this question has to keep coming up. How could the world not utterly jump on this? I mean, they jump on a 1.1 risk multiplier for ldl and heart disease all the time and covid was the biggest thing going on and you have a 10x risk factor i mean this is the biggest thing in covid for the whole three years but no this study from mark this was in april 90 he's actually a radiologist in philippines <laughs> a radiologist in the philippines did a similar study and published it and you can see again just shockingly the people with the mild cases they were the ones who were adequate in vitamin D. And here, another person, and I think this tweet was, again, it was in April 2020. This was going around very early in the COVID problem. And you can see here the blue line, 14% of all Americans, 36% of black Americans. You know, we had the BAME problem with COVID. This is a lot of it. And Native Americans are below 20, the blue line. But as I said, the blue line for what you should be above should be up here off the graph so kind of everyone's below it and i remember eric Hem hermstead uh, an md in the us he came out with this <laughs> he says does anyone see any covid patients with severity above 40 nanogram because i can't see any and he was working in icu right through uh, so this was standing out like a sore thumb and then the question becomes well how do you manage to be in this group with higher vitamin D and astonishingly lower risk? If everyone was in this group during COVID, you could divide the impact of the thing by 10. Now, given that in the UK, there was a 0.1% extra mortality right through 2020 in the peak year, by far the biggest impact year, the impact on excess mortality was 0.1% or one in a thousand with an average age or a median age of death in the 80s with three comorbidities or more. So you could argue, of course, that COVID in itself was, you know, like a bad flu or severe flu season. But imagine you divided it by 10. Yeah. But if you had all your people in here, you'd rough and tough divide it by 10. It would disappear. So why? And it again, it's not supplements per se. So if you eat vitamin D rich foods as it happens but highly nutrient dense healthy foods and you don't eat processed foods so you eat meat and fish and eggs and above ground vegetables if you're eating that all the time you're going to tend to have a high vitamin D level even if you're not getting a whole lot of sun you're going to tend to be naturally high the way the physiology works so that's one of the biggest ways I would ensure a healthy vitamin D 
if you avoid insulin resistance. You know, and around 70% of adult Americans over 45 years of age now, from the data, are pre-diabetic or diabetic. So they have insulin resistance, kind of type 2 diabetes, whether diagnosed or not. Um, but if you avoid that, which kind of near everyone has, but if you avoid it, uh, your vitamin D will be higher, regardless of other factors. So profound insulin resistance drops your vitamin D blood level like a stone. You know, we've many examples of this. If you avoid inflammatory problems, autoimmune problems, any of these issues, and you'll generally do it by, by achieving the above two, let's be honest, they're the big Pareto item to drive these problems. But if you avoid inflammatory issues, your vitamin D will tend to be a lot higher. So it's a way to get into this uh, magic club. And of course, healthy sun exposure. We know now from all the published data, more sun exposure extended life expectation across myriad studies. So it doesn't just create vitamin D, which is a precursor to many of your hormones and critical pathways, but it also causes you to increase nitric oxide, which causes vasodilation, you know, arterial health. And there's multiple other photo products come from the sun on our skin that have not even been investigated yet. So Professor Hollick made the point, three more complex molecules that are specifically generated in humans on exposure to sunlight, and no one's even bothered going after them. But I imagine if evolution decided to make those complex molecules with sun, uh, they have a good reason for being there, for health. So sun exposure, healthy sun, no burning, that's absurd. Our ancestors never burned. You know, as the sun came in in the spring, they were out, they were exposed, and they tanned, and they never burned. Uh, burning is a modern phenomenon from office workers who are stuck inside most of the time and then they get two weeks off, they go to the Canaries and they grill themselves. That's absurd. So healthy sun exposure without burning. That, that's the key. And then, of course, supplements. So in fairness, supplements, D3 supplements will raise your levels and probably are very good for people who are very low. I'm just worried that the causality of the supplement specifically raising D, does it really generate the same scenario as someone who's naturally high for the big reasons? And there's some data that would question that. Professor Hollick also pointed out that D3 supplements, the half-life of D in the blood generated by them, like for like, is around half the amount if you achieve the same amount from the sun and from foods. So there's a, there's a question mark there. Uh, I'm not anti-supplement, but I have a concern. So D for debacle. This is the talk I gave. Uh, this is a freeze frame uh, back in 2014. It's actually up to 300,000 views now, uh, but that's the snap. And uh, it was very popular, but I was a little over-enthusiastic about D at the time and a little over-dependent on supplements. Uh, to get the number. So that was a slight mistake I think I made at the time, but th that's okay. And I've taken some slides from that talk, and this one I love. The, the mass eye, the median uh, for the males, is 42 nanogram. That's, there's many things that say low 40s. One of the professors, Hollis, pointed out that the reaction that creates vitamin D in the body when you get to a certain level, it begins to self-correct. There's a feedback, a back feedback, and that happens in the low 40s nanogram. The actual biochemical processes level off. And also we know ancestrally, men in the 40s, women in the 50s is ancestrally normal for healthy indigenous populations. So that's another point. And I can't recall this 10 years ago. There's a third vector which also directs you to low 40s. So like it's coming from every side of the science. The low 40s region is the healthy human region. And the beauty of this study here, it looked at the mass size direct relations, the Bantu. And the only difference was they're genetically the same. There's no excuses for genetics. But they moved to the cities and adopted a whole different culture in the cities. And of course, they were exposed to processed foods, flour, vegetable oils, and the modern Western poisons. Uh, and also they were clothed fully in, the, in their city life, etc. 
So there's their vitamin D, direct comparison. Pretty much as bad as Westerners, okay? So I, I think it's a lovely proof point. And Weston Price, I don't think he got into D, but if, if he had been aware, he would have been hammering it home just like vitamin K and just like everything else from these ancestral peoples. Wyoming athletes, I got this from an unpublished paper, but uh, it was a great little piece of data. These are healthy, healthy eating, healthy exercising athletes. And they looked and said, well, what are they at? And it was in the summer, of course, and they run and they exposed to sun. These healthy runners are not worried about all the sun cream scares. So unsurprisingly, men in the 40s, women in the 50s. Okay. And this is a shocker I showed back then. I still am shocked by it. NHANES uh, 3 in the late 80s, early 90s, how many people or what proportion of the different people in America were above 30? Now, remember, you should be above 40. Uh, but 30, you could say you'd accept that as reasonable. And only 50% generally, and only around 40% when you got up to the 50s and the 60s in age, uh, in America. And that was in the late 80s, early 90s. Um, sex, it didn't break down too much, just the female effect we mentioned already. But then you can see black people were down at 10, right? Or sorry, 10% or 12% were above 30. Now remember, all their ancestors, we showed the Maasai, were median and averaged around the 40s. Only 10% of them now in America are above 30 even. Right, so that, that's quite shocking. And Mexican-American and other similarly pretty bad. But then the interesting thing was N. Haynes 2001 to 2004, just a decade later. And now what we have is only 20% in America are above 30 even. Okay. And for whites, yeah, dropped from 50 to 30% were above 30. But for black people, it fell to around 3 or 4% were only above 30, right? 97% were below 30. So this is how bad it is, guys. I mean, it's just, and this is back in the 2000s. I don't know what it is now. I mean, it, it's a shocker. And again, Mexican and other also collapsed. So this, that's why I called it the vitamin D debacle. One of the best markers for human metabolic health is vitamin D. And it should be in the 40s, you know? And just look at this. A catastrophe so and again i just remind you you know the original indigenous people would just be off the scale of this chart all of them would be above 30 and the overwhelming majority above 40 i mean they just blow the the bell off the top and and that's how crazy it is and i just think it's worthwhile internalizing how nuts it is I had hundreds of papers back then on vitamin D, but I, I particularly like this one, uh, the panacea of the sun, because I really focused on all the benefits of sunlight across many hormones, not just vitamin D, uh, a really great paper. And again, back then I emphasized, and it's much worse now, uh, that the majority are now below 30. I mean, crazy. So I talked a little back then about why vitamin D was important and how we ended up where we are. And we evolved in an intense UVB uh, environment. So it, it's encoded into our genes. Around 60,000 years ago, we all came from the equator. We all came out of Africa. We all came from the original humans. And one of the reasons that the pigmentation is so strong uh, in original humans is because the intensity of UV on the equator was obviously huge. And these guys and gals are out hunting and they're out in the sun and they're not wearing, you know, white linen clothes. Uh, they're practical. They needed to protect themselves. And one of the biggest things they needed to protect themselves is not sunburn per se, but damage to folate with UV excess affects, uh, you know, pregnancy and it ex affects your viability. So very strong evolutionary pressure. So when we lost the hair millions of years ago um, and we began to develop the ability to sweat so we could become striding hunters, you know, and cool ourselves uh, with, with sweat and we don't have hair, uh, we needed to develop something to protect us from the equatorial sun. So hence the deep black pigment. Uh, but when we moved and migrated, 
tens of thousands of years ago, there became a survival advantage to have lighter skin because with the lack of UV up north, meaning lower vitamin D, lower viability, uh, they would be a pre preferential selection with evolution for the people who happened to have lighter skin. And over a couple of tens of thousands of years, you'd end up with white skin. And that's largely what it was. And there was a fascinating study back then where they actually checked the skin uh, color in the armpit. So to be independent of whether the people had exposure to lots of sun or not. Obviously, if you looked at the forearm, you could have someone who's white, but they could have a dark brown forearm if they're out in the sun all the time, like a farmer. So they went into the armpit. And what they found was a direct correlation between the historical UV intensity in that area of the world and the actual tone of the skin. And it applied right across all the different skin colors from Caucasian right through to, you know, deepest Africa. So this theory is pretty much solid as a rock and it makes absolute sense. So we needed to keep our vitamin D as we move north, so we had to lose the pigment. But you can see how important vitamin D was that the whole pigmentation disappeared in order to acquire it, okay? Now, we'll go back to COVID a little because I, in April 2020, I was showing this. Italy threw the world into lockdowns, which we know now was intense and unreal corruption and a drive from the top, sadly. No conspiracy theory. That's pretty much documented. But Italy got hit hard, and they often get hit hard. It wasn't much worse than a few prior bad flu seasons over the last 30 years. But of course, on the television, we saw army coming in and then they falsified pictures. <laughs> they were using pictures. I, I don't know if you saw this uh, from several years ago in some kind of outbreak in some other part of the world. And they were using those to make a really emotional Italy. But northern Italy, latitudes around 30 to 45 degrees north. They had a high case fatality rate. They have the worst vitamin D deficiency rates in Europe. <laughs> now, if there's a 14x multiplier of severity relating to vitamin D, and that's documented and that's published, we just went through it. What, what, how is COVID going to behave in the worst vitamin D deficiency area of Europe? I mean, this is not rocket science, guys. Study of Italian women aged 60 to 80 found values of vitamin D lower than 5 nanogram in 27% of the women and lower than 12, which is like in your boots, in as many as 76% of women tested. And they were older women in Italy. I mean, come on. And another Italian study found a winter prevalence of hypovitaminosis D up to 32% of healthy postmenopausal women and up to 82% in patients engaged in long-term rehabilitation programs. You know, older people. These are in your boots levels, right? And Japan then had no impact. They had no lockdown. They wore the silly masks. We know that's nonsense now. Uh, we knew it at the time. But uh, they did get impacted hardly at all. And there was an amazing study that came out in Japan. And you're going to love this. And I should have put the slide in. In Japan, in 13 different municipalities uh, in, in Tokyo, they actually tested the antibodies for SARS-CoV-2. And they tested with PCR testing. And they did a perfect engineering test, the one I wanted. And it was the summer, I think, of 2020. And as they had a wave, they measured the people with PCR and also antibodies showing that they got the infection. And what happened was, during their wave, even though they had no hospitals overrun and they had no major mortality spike at all, that's a fact. What they saw was that these sample people, hundreds of them all across Tokyo, they reached up to nearly 50% PCR positivity and lagging behind that, they reached up to 45 plus percent positive antibody for SARS-CoV-2. In other words, Japan, of course, got riddled, but they didn't have any real impact. So Japan, let's look at their vitamin D. Japan's recovery rate seven times higher than deaths. In other northern territories, similar latitude, deaths and recovery rates are generally one to one. Now, this is early in COVID. Obviously, these rates are absurd in their own sense, but relative Japan to Italy, 
Japan also has a strikingly low incidence of vitamin D deficiency versus Europe, and they were attributing it in this study to fish, but to be honest, there's lots of other reasons I mentioned. It's not just fish. Prevalence of D below 12 nanogram in woman, women over 30 years old in Japan is only 10%, and in active elderly being below 30 is 5%. Now, we don't have all the data, but we know that Japan, broadly speaking, is in excellent health. And they're also a country that are very focused on health generally, healthy food, and also supplements. They're, they're really focused culturally on supplementation, etc. And just the last one, in Europe, vitamin D lower than 10 was found 2 to 30% of adults, uh, but of course, may, maybe up to 75% in, in older populations. So I, I just think it's the biggest story of COVID never told. And uh, I won't dwell on this one, but it doesn't perfectly match up, but there are strong linkages suggested that the vitamin D lowering in the winter is part of the seasonality of influenza and, and impact of coronavirus, because influenza and coronavirus are very close. They have the same season, same transmission mechanism of aerosol, that they're, they're really close together in many ways. So anyway, and... The studies have been mixed on supplements, as I mentioned. I mean, this one was published peer-reviewed and it was an RCT and it did appear to show supplementation having a big effect on a lower uh, impact of influenza, but the results are mixed. And again, just a bit concerned about that. So we'll get a little sciency before we wrap up. And again, you know, I was asked to do vitamin D, but again, some people might have thought that I'd be doing COVID more broadly or metabolic health more broadly. So we can do Q&A and get into any other topic. But I went through this in my original talk and I really loved it. And here's the study. And it just showed the profound nature of vitamin D. And basically you have around 35 trillion cells and every cell has your DNA, your code, unique out of 8 billion people. And it's in the nucleus of every one of those cells, pretty well, pretty much, right? Your own code. And your code is a library. And when your body has to do a job or get a protein or build muscle or fight back against a parasite, it goes into your DNA, <laughs> which is the library, and it actually writes off what it needs. It's just amazing stuff. And... Basically, your blood level uh, and 25 OHD, which is the blood level test, is active. I mean, we often look at 125 D diversion that's at vastly lower rates and, you know, is, is highly active and it relates to bone problems and hypoparathyroid. But, but 25 OHD itself is, um, is an active metabolite and it enables... And TB is the example I took here. And it's not indexing because I did something wrong. Okay. It actually is used to create 125D in response to, say, tuberculosis infection. And it goes to your DNA, essentially. And there's a retinol receptor there and the vitamin D receptor. And it locks onto your DNA. And it also, as it does this, to produce something to fight back against tuberculosis, it also produces and encodes a dehydroxylase to destroy its own weapon. So it actually is just amazing. It makes the weapon and it makes the thing that will diffuse the weapon at the appropriate time. So I just thought it was beautiful. Uh, and it's only a tip of the iceberg of vitamin D's importance in myriad reactions. So, as I said, it goes in and links to your DNA. It actually unwinds the two strands of your DNA. You can imagine doing this with just chemistry. It does that. And it spins off the piece of the DNA that encodes for what it wants. And it's an mRNA, not that one. <laughs> this is a good one. <laughs> and um, it transcribes and takes the piece of code from your DNA that it wants for catalcidin which is an anti kind of microbial. And again, the safety switch is made to then destroy this when the time comes, because otherwise it'll be problematic. Uh, the mRNA that's transcribed goes into the cytoplasm of the cell, 
where, like most mRNAs, as we now know <laughs> from the latest mass medication, uh, your cell will grab mRNAs and just replicate them like hell, right? And it replicates these critical proteins in a good way in this case uh, and makes catalcidin, which is an anti-TB kind of weapon of sorts. So that just gave an example, just it gave a kind of frisson or a sousong or just an insight into what's actually going on with vitamin D. It's not just like, you know, all oh, vitamin D, it's higher is better. And we're going to finish off and I'm going to, at the risk of redundancy, go through this process again to embed it. What makes you the person with vastly lower heart disease, cancers, yada, 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 and also maybe up to 15 times lower impact from COVID. What makes that magical state? It's eating meat, fish, and eggs, and super nutrient-dense, natural, ancestral, evolutionary human foods, and not eating ultra-processed foods, or breads, or pastas, or any of that crap. It's avoiding insulin resistance, which you do by doing what I just said, mostly, right? And then you'll end up with a high vitamin D. It's avoiding autoimmune and inflammatory conditions, which you will do by doing the above two. So they're all related. That's how you get to be the green person, not green man, green person, because we're all about equity. And if you access healthy sun, you're going to beat the hell out of your kind of competitor for longevity who's avoiding the sun or slathering themselves with sunscreen because the man, the nice man on the telly told them to or the nice man in the pharmaceutical company, right? So this is going to help you be this person. And of course, in fairness, supplements, I have no doubt have a benefit. They'll raise vitamin D for people who are low or people in care homes or people who live in Ireland or England during the winter, and I'm not knocking them, but I'm concerned that this is seen as the panacea and it may not deliver anything like what these four things deliver. So the note of caution. And I'll finish with a slide I took from one of the professors I mentioned earlier. I think it's Hollis. Uh, beautiful slide pack. But uh, this is the summary of vitamin D. Essentially, there's the mortality expectation for being low in vitamin D. And it's age-adjusted hazard ratios. 32 studies combined together for the big outcome. Expected age of mortality. And high vitamin D... I don't think you can argue with this one. So there you are, folks. You can't argue with that, can you? So sound science, simple solutions. And most of the work I do is pretty much pro bono, getting out videos, getting out information, countering corporate and legacy media misinformation. And you saw there with the vitamin D example that no media would cover the biggest story in the whole of the COVID saga. So that goes to show you the headwinds we're up against. So really appreciate the support I get from my Patreons and PayPal uh, supporters. And it's huge and it keeps me going, keeps the train on the track. So anyone else who can support a little, I'd really appreciate that. And my existing supporters, of course, you make it all possible. So thank you.